Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. Now, we begin the task of building from our foundation, and in doing so, giving rise to a more resilient, equitable city of opportunity for all. COVID-19 leaving San Antonio in a rocky place. So what are the issues the mayor is focused on as we move forward? And what did he have to say about the protests taking place in our city? That story coming up, but first. We've got some breaking news tonight. Police making another arrest linked to the violence Saturday night. Officers say 21-year-old Nathan Abraham Carranza is accused of causing damage to a church on East Travis after throwing rock like objects at the building. That's right. Investigators say more than $3,000 worth of damage was done. Carranza was arrested on the south side after investigators found video linking him to the incident. He now faces a third degree felony for rioting and criminal mischief involving a church. Because it's a church, the charge would increase to a state jail felony. The police say more arrests could be made as their investigation into Saturday's riot continues. Police have said the violence Saturday night is separate from the peaceful protest that happened that afternoon. Extraordinary times. That was the description that Mayor Ron Nuremberg used to begin his speech tonight. That's right. Speaking live from his office, the mayor's third ever state of the city address was certainly unusual. City Hall reporter Gary Berger joins us live in the newsroom to take us through the highlights. Well, the mayor's nearly 20 minute speech focused heavily on the COVID-19 pandemic, but it wasn't just about where the city's at, but also where the mayor hopes we end up. The fight against COVID-19 has been a slog already, but Mayor Ron Nuremberg said San Antonians following social distancing precautions have made an impact. A study by the Big City Health Coalition and Drexel University has shown you have collectively saved more than 9,000 lives in our community. Nuremberg said the city is ready for a second wave, but he also said the pandemic has exposed buried fault lines in our community and massive disparities that need to be addressed as the city recovers. He spoke of city council's upcoming vote on a $191 million recovery and resiliency plan, which would include money for job training, rent assistance, small business grants, and internet access for students, among other things. We must end at as, as an equitable city, where all residents have enough food, a roof over their heads, and a fair chance at an education and a good job. Nuremberg also said he'd be convening a group of community leaders to help determine how to fight socioeconomic inequity with education and training. COVID is a tragedy, but the pandemic can be an agent of monumental change if we use it as a catalyst to solve the challenges that have hindered our ability to reach the next level. But as these issues take center stage, others move to the background, like a push to divert a one-eighth of a cent sales tax to via Metropolitan Transit. The mayor, who originally wanted the tax on the November ballot, said that's no longer in the cards. We will take the time we need to fully understand the depth of the pandemic's financial damage before making new investments. And with an expected budget shortfall just shy of $200 million this year and a tough fiscal 2021 to come, the mayor warned business as usual is out of the question. But he said the city will make it through. For the worst is temporary and the best is yet to come. Thank you. Now, the mayor also spoke briefly about the ongoing protests in the city, drawing a distinction between what he called legitimate marches for justice and unfortunate violence by opportunists. Steve, Jaffney. Thank you, Garrett. Of course, we'll be talking more about that state of the city address in the days to come. But as the unrest in America continues, the city of San Antonio will continue nightly closures of Alamo Plaza for the rest of the week. Each night, the area will be closed to vehicular and pedestrian traffic from 830 at night to 6 a.m. the next morning. It'll continue with the last closure scheduled on Saturday night to Sunday morning. Police will also increase staffing in the downtown area to mitigate any potential disturbances. President Donald Trump has said he would be ready to deploy thousands of heavily armed soldiers in cities across the country to disperse protests. When Texas Governor Greg Abbott was asked if the state would seek that option, the governor had this to say. So we will not be asking the United States military to come into the state of Texas because we know that Texans can take care of Texans. Texans can take care of Texans. Governor Abbott went on to say, Along with the tremendous local police force in cities across the state, there is also an abundance of resources provided by the Texas Department of Public Safety. 
San Antonio saw another day of protests following the death of George Floyd. The Houston native was killed in Minneapolis while in police custody. Today, hundreds gathered at the Bear County Courthouse. Sky 12 was over the scene catching it all. The crowd made their way to San Antonio Police Headquarters before returning to the courthouse and chanting. It's the same route we followed with Sky 12. Hours after the protest began, we saw members near the convention center before making their way into downtown, then back to the courthouse. Earlier today, crews caught up with the protesters. This is the fourth night of protests taking place in Alamo City. Demonstrators promise there will be more protests until the reasons behind them are effectively addressed. Never forget, never get lazy. Uh, whenever this happens again, we need to come up and do this again. We need to keep doing it until it stops. We just want to change the system, so I feel like everybody should vote. Even though it is one vote, every vote matters. Now, we've seen protests continue in a peaceful manner. Saturday afternoon's protest in San Antonio also peaceful, and as Police Chief William McManus has said, was separate from the violence that was caused largely by agitators that night. And as peaceful protest continues, what's next? From a local activist to former President Barack Obama, people are looking ahead and hope changes are made across the country. Tiffany Huertas has a look at what they say needs to be done. No justice! No peace! It was just a really, really great uh, atmosphere, and it was just so peaceful, and I'm just so happy that, you know, this city represented uh, black lives. 21-year-old Kamiya Factory helped organize the peaceful protest that took place at Travis Park on Saturday afternoon. People were out there because the nation is enraged. Uh, we wanted to stand in solidarity with the protests happening across the country, um, and we want to make sure that San Antonio represents black lives. Kamiya says she wants to keep the conversation going. This should not just be something because it's trending or because it's a hashtag. Black lives matter. They have always mattered and they will continue to matter. In a recently published article, former President Barack Obama addressed the protests happening across the country and how he thinks people can move forward. He says in part, quote, ultimately, it's going to be up to a new generation of activists to shape strategies that best fit the times, end quote. He also wrote about the importance of voting and participating in politics. Camilla agrees. The way to make sure that our police and our mayor and our systems look the way that we want them to um, is to vote um, and to reflect the representation of the people. Camilla wants to continue to bring awareness to these issues. Now that I know the community uh, is supportive of, you know, this cause, I without a doubt want to continue this work in San Antonio. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. We have a joint primary runoff election next month. If you haven't done so already, be sure to register to vote. You still have about two weeks left to register. You can find an application on votetexas.gov. We also have a link on our website at ksat.com. And don't forget to cast your ballots during the November elections. An update at your local HEB. The chain of stores saying it will no longer deny entry to customers who are not wearing a mask. HEB partners and employees are still required to use them, though. In a statement, the company says, quote, HEB strongly encourages the use of masks or facial coverings by all of our customers in all of our stores. It goes on to say several municipalities in Texas have mandatory mask orders. HEB abides by the ordinances in those areas by strongly encouraging the use of masks, but we will not deny entry, end quote. Taking a quick quick look at the latest numbers of COVID-19 here in Bear County. Since the start of all this, our area has confirmed 2,882 cases. More than 1,700 people have recovered, leaving 1,062 people still fighting that disease tonight. 92 people are in the hospital. 75 people have died. Every day we are learning more about COVID-19. Asymptomatic cases are still puzzling health professionals, but a new study here in San Antonio could help answer some questions. Dr. Dom Emmerich provided details in today's briefing on their newly launched random selective study.
What it's really going to do is to help us fill in that unknown of asymptomatics. We just don't know how much is here. Metro Health, along with UT Health San Antonio and the San Antonio Fire Department's Mobile Integrated Healthcare Program, launched an asymptomatic COVID-19 study in the community. The plan is to have around 500 samples taken from the community during the study by the end of the week. The smart people will do all the statistical analysis on that, and uh, and then that will really help us look at a good quantifiable uh, number of the prevalence of asymptomatic positives. Ten teams of two members will go to hundreds of households to request a volunteer to be tested. The sampling is said to happen around town with about 50 households per district. It started yesterday and we had about just under 90 people that had consented to to um, get swapped, if you will, to, to get tested. And then today we had just about the same amount. The study will also help with understanding how asymptomatic people transmit the virus to another. If you know what the prevalence is, then you can make some assumptions of transmission. It will also help us generate additional research questions to better understand that transmission of asymptomatic, which is always the unknown that we're seeing across our country. Now, if selected, the criteria says a household member who volunteers must be over the age of 18 and have never been tested for COVID-19. They also must have no symptoms and consent to participate. Investing in the stock market. It may sound difficult, but there are ways to make it easier. Tomorrow on GMSA, you're going to see how millennials are becoming new investors with the help of apps. How you can tap into the technology tomorrow on Good Morning San Antonio. Also keeping tabs on the peaceful protesters that we've been watching throughout the evening. Actually, they're near the uh, Bear County Courthouse right now. This is not the best live picture from Sky 12, but they started at the Bear County Courthouse actually around three o'clock this afternoon, and that is they've still since been moving around the city. That actually looks like it might be uh, Travis Park that we're seeing right there, and you can see a number of protesters are there again. Peaceful protests, peaceful marches and chants throughout the day, and those are continuing into the evening, though clearly not as large as some of the protests we saw during the 6 o'clock news. It's still ahead on the night beat. Houston saw massive protests for George Floyd. His family also participating in the marches in his hometown. We're going to head there for the latest. And amid the pandemic, Dr. Ruth Brendan answering questions for KSAT Q&A tonight. And was it was believed the summer heat could help combat the coronavirus. What the head of the National Institutes of Health is now saying. Next on the night meet. The death of George Floyd leading to a major investigation for the Minneapolis Police Department. A civil rights investigation now launched. This comes as America braces for the eighth night of unrest. Investigators will look back at the police department's practices for the past decade. The mother of George Floyd's six year old daughter spoke out on Tuesday. He will never see her grow up, graduate. He will never walk her down the aisle. If it's a problem she's having and she needs her dad, she does not have that anymore. In the nation's capital, protesters gathered outside of the heavily guarded White House. Massive protests took place in Houston, where George Floyd is originally from. The massive crowd marched through the city's downtown, carrying signs and chanting. They then demonstrated in front of a city hall. City leaders attended and gave speeches about Floyd, the man who died in Minneapolis police custody. Some of Floyd's family also took part in the event. His controversial death has sparked days of protest around the world. And a tribute to Floyd was painted just blocks from where he went to school in Houston. His face, along with angel wings on his back and a halo above his head, were set against a blue background. The phrase written in the halo references Floyd's last words, I can't breathe, which has become a rallying cry over the past few days. The funeral for Floyd will be held June 9th in Houston. And back here at home, an east Side business provided the canvas for a mural of George Floyd. The portrait meant to honor Floyd while uniting the community towards a brighter tomorrow. We first showed you the mural last night. You can also take another look on KSAT.com. 
We have an update tonight. The head of the National Institutes of Health says summer heat is unlikely to stop the spread of the coronavirus. Dr. Francis Collins gave that assessment in a blog post Tuesday, citing experts in infectious disease transmission and climate modeling. He wrote, quote, climate only would become an important seasonal factor in controlling COVID-19 once a large proportion of people within a given community are immune or resistant to infection. He wrote, They'll have to wait a few months for the data, but for now, many researchers have their doubts that the pandemic will enter a needed summertime lull. Early in the pandemic, it was speculated summer heat might lessen the spread and possibly even kill the virus. And a reminder today marks one week since Metro Health launched its COVID-19 community survey. They want to learn about testing, symptoms, social distancing behavior in every zip code. The survey would be used to help with future measures in the coming months. We have a link on KSAT.com. The survey will be evaluated periodically through August 3rd. Some good news tonight. The class of 2020 is getting their gowns ready for the end of the week in Bernie. Bernie ISD plans to hold two graduation ceremonies this week. Maintenance teams have already begun to set up for the ceremonies at Bernie ISD Stadium. Safety measures include a careful spacing of chairs all arranged six feet apart on the field. Champion High School has their graduation scheduled for Thursday at 8 p.m. Bernie High School will hold their ceremony on Friday night. That'll be interesting to watch. Oh, yeah, how the whole thing plays out. And, you know, if it was the last few days, how they dodged the rain showers. Out there. Mm -hmm. Again, I believe this is Travis Park that we're looking at with yeah. live cam with some of the uh, few protesters that are left out there. Yeah, you know, earlier today we had some showers and downpours across the area and it was good. Good maintenance rain. Some folks reported in with two inches of rain or more. Now that was near Rimkin Park, Rimkis Park in Leon Valley, but also New Braunfels. Lynn up in New Braunfels reported eight tenths of an inch. So slight chance of showers as we get into tomorrow. I don't think it'll be quite as widespread as what we had today. Also, as our rain chances fall off, temperatures go up, so it'll be getting hotter. And the latest on Tropical Storm Cristobal coming right up. We'll give you that track and let you know uh, the latest from the Hurricane Center. But here's a great look outside from earlier today. We saw some great rainbows out there. That's what I love about these patterns where we get those tropical downpours in the afternoon and evening because it leads to good rainbows. That's a double rainbow over Floresville. You got this over San Antonio from Crown Ridge, and this is another nice one from Carlos. Yes, that is a good rainbow shining right down onto the Alamo City. All right, here's a look from our south side camera and notice as we go through time this afternoon, five, six o'clock, that downpour moved through and then the sky cleared out and it turned into a very pleasant evening. 87, that was our high temperature today after a low of 70, so both a little below average. The rainfall, a hundredth of an inch at the airport. But of course, not everybody lives at the airport. Some backyards had much more than that. Take a look at the 48 hour rainfall estimates and there you go. You get into some of these neighborhoods and the actual estimates were well over an inch of rain and I even saw a report from Timberwood Park of around an inch of rain. So it was good. Added up to some decent rainfall for some folks, whereas others, well, they didn't have anything. So this is still a little related to this upper level circulation that we have that's moving into Oklahoma and that's moving out of town. And as it does, so our rain chances will continue to fall off. So tomorrow, a 20% chance we're looking at a few isolated pop up downpours tomorrow afternoon. Then we get into Thursday, Friday timeframe, and I think you have to be really close to the Gulf coastline to really even see any pop up sea breeze shower. So here in San Antonio, we're looking at basically not even a shot at rain by late Thursday all the way through the weekend and early next week. And guess what's going to be replacing this disturbance? Big Blue H will be settling back in and that's going to have an influence on our temperatures for sure. So here's the latest on Tropical Storm Cristobal. Max sustained winds at 50 miles per hour, some gusts up to 65, still a broad uh, circulation down there in the Bay of Campeche. Now this is just a meandering storm. It's not really moving quickly, it's going to dive south, likely to make landfall in Mexico and then start to drift northward again, maybe re-strengthen a little bit. And we're talking even by Friday 7 p.m. near the Yucatan Peninsula. Then we get into Saturday and Sunday this weekend. And by Sunday, it could, could potentially affect parts of the Gulf Coastline, anywhere from Texas, Louisiana, to Mississippi, Alabama, or Western Florida. We'll just keep you updated right now, nothing to worry about.
So temperatures in the 70s it was pleasant out there this evening, especially after the dry lines, or I shouldn't say the dry lines, but the uh, outflow boundaries moved through and we had that nice gust of cool air from some of those thunderstorms. So mostly in the 70s, 81 Laredo, 85 Del Rio. Those are the warmer locations. Tomorrow we'll start the day at 70, make it to 90 for the high temperature. Nice mixture of sun and clouds and just that 20% chance of a few pop up showers. By Thursday and Friday, we're starting to turn up the heat a little bit, turning that dial 94 by Friday, bright sunshine this weekend. Good pool weather. Hopefully there's a pool open in your area and you can get to it because we're looking at upper 90s with that sunshine by Sunday. You guys know my mom bought my dog, Bo, a pool and I think I'm, I might steal it from <laughs> I was going to say, how big? It, 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 it's, it's big enough that I can get in it. So. Okay. All right, well, that's good. <laughs> I'll test it out. By the way, you know, usually this time of year, our friend Greg Simmons likes to point out the long sleeves, maybe the light jacket he takes to California <laughs> for Cowboys camp. Because it's so chilly at night yeah. during the summer. Yeah, well, you have to keep in the closet. No Ventura Pier, no Ventura County Fair, no, no Grand Park, no. no California. When we no. come back, the Dallas Cowboys will not be able to hold their training camp in California. When we come back, we'll tell you why. And welcome back high school athletes coming up. I clearly understand uh, what training camp needs to look like, and, and I just got to make sure we're ready to do it at either Oxford or Frisco. New Cowboys coach Mike McCarthy was waiting for a decision on where they could hold training camp, and now he's got it. Oxnard is out, Frisco is in, and big board sports. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. For the first time in eight years, the Dallas Cowboys will not hold their training camp in California. That's after the NFL told all of its teams today that all training camps will be held at the team's training facilities due to the coronavirus. The Cowboys are in the last year of their training camp contract with Oxnard, but city officials had said that negotiations were underway for a three-year extension. But the COVID-19 pandemic has tabled those plans for now. The big advantage to holding their training camp in California was the weather, where a hot day outside was in the upper 70s in the middle of summer, and the hotel complex had not one but two fields. Preparations were already underway in Oxnard. Even a plan that would have banned fans from the stands, which is one of the team's training camp trademarks. At the Star in Frisco, the Cowboys only have one outdoor grass field, but also have access to the Ford Center, which is a 12,000-seat stadium inside. Normally, training camp opens in the third week of July, but the NFL has not issued an opening date as yet. The last time the Cowboys did not train in California, 2011. That was the last year it was held right here in San Antonio. The NBA Board of Governors will vote on the league's proposal to return to play this Thursday with the prevailing thought is that it will be the 22-team format with a play-in tournament before the playoffs begin. If that is the case, then the plan would include the Spurs, who currently sit in 20th position, four games back at the Memphis Grizzlies for the eighth and final playoff spot. If the season does resume at the Wide World of Sports Complex in Orlando on July 31st, then the last possible date for the NBA Finals Game 7 will be October the 12th. That is a timeline that was shared with all teams, according to ESPN, with the NBA draft and the start of free agency to follow in October. Board of Governors require three-fourths passage of all 30 teams in order to implement the plan to restart the season that was shut down in March due to the coronavirus. Former Spur Stephen Jackson says he has received calls from former Spur, now Golden State Warriors head coach Steve Kerr, former Spurs assistant Mike Brown, LeBron James, and NBA Commissioner Adam Silver in the wake of the death of his childhood friend George Floyd. Now, Jackson, who helped the Spurs win their NBA championship, in 2003 says a conversation with Silver lasted almost 30 minutes says it was the first time any NBA commissioner had ever called him other than when he was suspended for 30 games. Jackson met Floyd in Houston when they were young and looked so much alike Jackson called Floyd his twin. Boyd's funeral will be in Houston on June the 9th. Hall of Famer and one of the top 50 players in NBA history, Wes Unsel, has passed away. Unsel's family says through the Washington Wizards franchise that he died today after a series of health issues, the most recent being pneumonia. Unsel played his entire career in Washington, was one of only two players to win NBA Rookie of the Year and MVP in the same season, the other being Wilt Chamberlain. A decade later, he was MVP of the NBA Finals as the then Washington Bullets beat the Seattle Supersonics to win their only NBA championship in 1970. After 13 seasons on the floor, bad knees would force Unsel to retire in 1981, but he stayed on with Washington as a coach and then as a front office as general manager. Wes Unsel leaves us at the age of 74.
San Antonio Christian School is one of the first to allow student athletes back on campus beginning with limited summer workouts at 7 a.m. in the morning. It's after the Texas Association of Private and Parochial Schools announced last week that workouts can begin on June 1st, one week ahead of the University Interscholastics League's opening on June the 8th. It's been over two and a half months since the coronavirus ended high school sports, canceled in the middle of the Boys State High School basketball tournament in the Alamo Dome last March. Sachs welcoming back over 70 student athletes, including members of its football team, and they couldn't be happier. It's really exciting to see the guys and to get to work with everyone. It's, it's been hard to work out alone and find the motivation, but with the guys, it's a lot easier. They can push you to your limit. When I first heard that we were coming back, uh, I, that night I couldn't sleep. Uh, it was so, I was so happy uh, to be out back here uh, with all my guys. Uh, we're a family out here. It's so exciting to be back. Usually first day of summer strength and conditioning, they're dreading it. Uh, but no, they're bouncing around and there's an energy and an enthusiasm that is great to see. The Texas State Bobcats also welcome back 53 student athletes in their football program beginning on Monday as part of their three phase plan. It also allows athletic staff members to return to their offices on the San Marcos campus. A part of the plan, each staff member and athlete has to enter the school facilities through controlled entry areas where their temperatures are checked. They go through symptom screenings for the coronavirus. Social distancing is required and where it's not possible, face masks must be worn during indoor workouts. Phase one also allows voluntary workouts in groups of no more than 10 players in the weight rooms, training rooms and on the gym wax football field. So great news. A lot of these folks, these kids are able to come back to their schools now. Yep. The reopening continues. Looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, right. Greg. We'll be right back. If peaceful protesters continue to gather in Minneapolis today, not only to grieve the death of George Floyd, but to continue to demand justice against the three remaining officers who've yet to be charged in connection with his death. This as Americans took to the streets for another day. ABC's Alex Perche in Minneapolis with the details. Tonight, the family of George Floyd anticipating additional charges for those former Minneapolis police officers in his case. The family attorney saying this on CNN. We believe that there will be charges of the other three officers before George Floyd is laid to rest. The state's attorney general saying they'll be coming soon. Hey, look, uh, we're doing this as fast as we can. And today, the mother of George Floyd's six-year-old daughter speaking out for the first time. He will never see her grow up, graduate. He will never walk down the aisle. At the site of Floyd's death, the community's coming together. Donations pouring in, water, food, even masks. These local business owners handing out roses to sympathizers for free. You can come here and cry. You can come here and pray. You can come here and mingle and talk and hug people. With so much of the scene here is about preserving the memory of George Floyd, from protesters remaining peaceful to them rushing to cover the signs and flowers with tarps as the rains come in. Images of peaceful protests from across the country just hours before new curfews go into effect. San Francisco, Orlando, Houston, New York City, thousands marching without incident. But some cities experiencing violence and looting overnight. In New York, windows smashed, stores ransacked, from the Macy's flagship store to Rockefeller Plaza. The city moved up its curfew to 8 p.m. tonight after the fourth night of looting. The governor today blasting the mayor and the police department. They have to do a better job. But separate the protesters from the looting. LA's police chief sparking outrage after suggesting looters were as responsible for George Floyd's death as those fired police officers. We didn't have people mourning the death of this man, George Floyd. We had people capitalizing. His death is on their hands, as much as it is those officers. The chief later apologizing, calling his own words terribly offensive. And today, L.A. officers kneeling with protesters at a faith-based march. Alex Perche, ABC News, Minneapolis. A change now and talk about something we're calling KSAT Q&A. It started out of the coronavirus pandemic, but now we're kind of morphing it in different directions. But we are joined today by infectious disease doctor from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio, Dr. Ruth Bergeron. Doctor, thank you for joining us as you do most Tuesdays. Uh, talk about, I, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name of this drug out of Russia, <laughs> uh, but you are encouraged by what you're seeing 
from that particular uh, uh, drug, correct? Yeah, so the drug's actually not from Russia, Steve. It's called favipiravir, and it was developed in Japan as okay. an influenza drug. And it turns out that it has antiviral activity against a lot of RNA viruses, which the coronavirus is. But the Japanese have been using it as an approved drug for the flu for six years at least. It's also been approved for use for the flu in China. So this is a drug that has a track record in humans to treat RNA viruses. That's really exciting. Um, Russia decided to approve it for a, kind of an emergency use approval based on data from a clinical trial that they completed there, showing that it decreases the duration of symptoms from a median of nine to about five days. And they cite something, they say it's an 80% Efficacy. I'm not sure how to interpret that because that number hasn't been reported in a peer-reviewed journal. But here's the, the good news, is that this is another drug in our armamentarium. It is available as a pill, as opposed to remdesivir, which we have now, as you know, for emergency use in the U.S., which is only IV. If this drug works, then we could be seeing people using it at home. And there are more than 22 clinical trials either ongoing or beginning to enroll or getting or on the verge of enrolling for this drug, including in the United States, several sites in Massachusetts, like the Massachusetts General Hospital, the Brigham and Women's University of Massachusetts, and um, on the West Coast, Stanford University. We have uh, an inkling that we might be able to become a site for this drug here in San Antonio. So stay tuned. It's just another piece of good news that gives us hope that we are making progress as we fight the COVID-19 pandemic. That is some great news. Uh, thanks for sharing that. And I want to transition to the protests. Everyone's been talking about this. Uh, of course, the protests are there for a specific reason, but COVID-19 has not gone away. There are a lot of people close together. Uh, a lot of people in San Antonio were wearing masks, but there were a bunch that were not. Um, I'm curious about your concerns with COVID spreading. What could this mean for us? And what do you recommend for the people who were there all close together like this? Yeah, so um, we don't recommend that people congregate. I understand the protests and I support peaceful protest. People uh, spread far apart. Um, as far as what people should do if they were there, um, I, I really can't say that one size fits all. You know, if you were an individual who was unmasked and you were in a very crowded area for more than a couple minutes, then you might want to go and have a test, especially if you've got older folks or medically at risk people that you live with. So that's my advice to those folks. But I believe that peaceful protest in 2020, um, we need to be creative about it. And I think we should look at online activities and webinars and people can write op-eds and uh, find all sorts of ways that don't require being really close together, closer than six feet. And for sure, don't be unmasked. When we talk about a possible second wave coming, are we talking about the fall? Are we talking about the winter? Or are we, are we still talking about possibly happening in the summer? So anytime you have somebody that gets exposed, the incubation period is around 14 days. Now, most people, if they're gonna get symptomatic, uh, on average, they would get symptomatic about five days after their exposure to somebody who was infectious. So you wanna look out always, you know, two weeks ahead of some event um, that has happened that you worry about. Um, that said, if we continue to have a lot of protests and if people don't mask and if they congregate together in closed spaces, you might expect to see some activity of the virus picking up in about two weeks. So it's just a, a word to remind everyone that we have to remember that there is a new normal now for how we conduct ourselves during the COVID-19 pandemic. And speaking of the fall, we have some big elections coming up and we know that at polling sites, people tend to stand close together. Um, there's a lot of talk about curbside voting. How do you feel about that? Yeah, so um, first I want to say that we have some really wonderful election officials here in Bear County. And also um, there was a document for guidance about elections that came from the Secretary of State last week. And overall, it's very careful 
um, and very well informed. I will say that I spent time with election officials and poll workers last week to learn what it's really like when they do curbside voting. And it seems like it might be so simple. You just put a big thing that looks like a large iPad into a crate or a basket and hand it to somebody through a car window, let that person do their thing electronically, they put it back in the basket and give it to you, and they're all done, right? Well, actually, um, many people need a lot of help learning how to use that device. It's apparently not intuitive, especially for older people. And our election officials are um, telling us that they typically have to get into a van where there might be a lot of elderly people or disabled people, and then they have to slowly make their way forward in the van, assisting each person, sometimes getting very close to their faces and shouting um, to explain what's going on. That is not recommended. And because um, we are not in this state requiring the voters to be masked, that puts the election official at some risk. And guess what the average age of an election official is in Bear County? The average age is 72. So those are folks that are at risk of a bad outcome if they should get infected. So in the interest of keeping our elections safe for everybody, we need to really think through this issue of curbside voting. And for sure, people who have symptoms of COVID-19, they should not be the ones that are asking for curbside voting. Um, and they for sure should be wearing masks and seeking alternative ways to get their vote done that doesn't expose medically vulnerable people to COVID-19. Absolutely. Dr. Ruth Bergeron, thank you for your time. As always, we'll see you next week. Glad to be with you. We'll be right back. Go on, check in with Sky 12 on some activity that's taking place downtown. Uh, this is not far from Commerce Street. Hard to tell exactly what's going on, but you see a small group of people who seem to be running away from police. There you see the first cruiser that we've seen. We've also seen uh, some bicycle police in the area. Uh, again, this does not look like protesters. It looks like it's a handful of uh, people that are out there. Uh, we were told at one point they were in front of the Whataburger off Commerce Street where there was some damage done. Mm. It looks right now like they may actually be over by the uh, Herman and Sons area and then back towards the courthouse is where I think this is going. We're continuing to monitor the situation out there. We have not seen anything um, illegal happening, but you can tell the police are certainly out in force and monitoring the downtown street oh, sure. tonight. Um, when I was in Travis Park on Sunday, there were several, several bike police out and about, and they just said that they were just there monitoring and just keep making sure the area stays safe. So SAPD is definitely on point when it comes down to making sure nothing happens like it did on Saturday night. Yeah, and again, they've turned off the uh, lights at this point, just seem to be patrolling. Um, again, it's the area where the protesters were, but like we said, they were pretty uh, a small group when we took them the last time. You know, so I don't see a lot going on right now, but San Antonio police certainly uh, out and about in downtown San Antonio tonight. Well, a number of religious leaders and politicians coming forward today condemning President Donald Trump's actions last night. And President candidate Joe Biden speaking publicly for the first time in months, criticizing the president's response to the nationwide demonstrations. ABC's Ramina Puga reports. As President Trump rode through the Capitol today, citizens jeered the presidential limousine. The president and first lady visited the Washington, D.C. shrine to St. John Paul II. This is the second day in a row he has visited a place of worship that has sparked controversy. Today's outing follows outrage over the forceful removal of peaceful protesters Monday night from Lafayette Park. All to clear the way for a photo opportunity, the president holding up a Bible in front of St. John's Church. A source tells ABC News that it was Attorney General Bill Barr who gave the order to remove demonstrators using force. An Australian TV crew seen here, the photographer hit in the face, his colleague hit with a baton. In a statement today, Barr praised the work of law enforcement but made no mention of the situation in front of Lafayette Park. Among the first to express outrage was the Bishop of Washington. He is not entitled to use the spiritual symbolism of our 
sacred spaces and our sacred texts to promote or to justify a completely entire, uh, a entirely different message. And today's visit to that Catholic shrine also drawing criticism from DC's Archbishop Wilton Gregory, who condemned the visit as a publicity stunt and called it baffling and reprehensible. Presidential candidate Joe Biden also condemning that photo op. I just wish he opened it once in a while instead of brandishing it. If he opened it, he could have learned something. Biden calling on Congress to ban chokeholds and vowing to establish a National Police Oversight Commission. But I promise you this, I won't traffic in fear and division. I won't fan the flames of hate. Tuesday saw more peaceful demonstrations outside the White House. New video shows Senator Elizabeth Warren joining protesters with her husband. He is imposing violence on our people. People are here to protest peacefully. And today's primary is taking Joe Biden closer to becoming the Democratic presidential nominee. The election less than six months away. In Colorado, Romina Puga, ABC News. Live cam outside and you can see, you know what? This is a nice, calm night. Yeah, it some is. rain showers. We did have those rain showers, and you guys know how much I love me some rain, but I didn't appreciate how much I had to tackle my hair before the show started. Hey, it, was, yeah. it was rough. <laughs> yeah, it was good maintenance rain, though, because we wiped away a good portion of the drought, especially in Bear County, and it was good for the aquifer and the northern parts of the county where you have the recharge zone. And no change in the aquifer level today. We're at 672.2, but we're about 9.5 feet above the June average. We're far from any watering restrictions right now, too. Mold is high at 3,500 grass on the low end. So let's talk about our rain chances as we go forward here. And you'll see tomorrow a 20% chance. That's it. So not, nothing as widespread as what we had earlier today. The showers not as numerous, but a few popping up. And then we really don't see much of anything in terms of rain chances by the end of the week and into the upcoming weekend. Sometimes we look to the tropics, especially this time of year, for a nice splash of rain. Tropical systems can be drought erasers. But this one right now doesn't look like it's going to be uh, moving into our neck of the woods. Still a lot of uncertainty with it, but this is Tropical Storm Cristobal, and this is going to hang around the Bay of Campeche and parts of Mexico here along the Yucatan Peninsula for several days. I mean, look at this, Friday 5 p.m., and it's still basically right on the edge of the Bay of Campeche. Then it pushes northward Saturday into Sunday, and that's by Sunday is when it could affect anywhere anybody from the Texas coastline eastward to parts of the western panhandle of Florida. That's the possibility with, the, with this system. But right now, it doesn't look like it's going to throw any moisture our way. We'll keep you updated. High temperatures today. Across the state, El Paso was the hottest, 99 degrees. But for the most part, we were 80s to right near 90. And get ready for these numbers to jump up later on this week. I mean, Del Rio did make it to 93 today. Gonzales was 90. 87 here in San Antonio and right now it's comfortable outside. Actually, once those showers moved through, we had the rain cooled air. Other folks had the nice outflow boundaries that dropped their temperatures a bit and it's been pleasant for the most part. We're in the 70s at this hour, 81 degrees in Laredo and 83 Del Rio. Oh, we're feeling the humidity, of course, that wind coming off the Gulf of Mexico. It's not strong. It doesn't matter, though. Gulf waters are warm into the 80s and We've got that wind coming off of there and dew points, low 70s. It is sticky outside. That's what we'd expect, though, this time of year. All right, here's the day planner for tomorrow. Some low clouds to start the day at 70 degrees. Then a good amount of sunshine, just a patchy fair weather clouds. 90 degrees the high temperature and that 20% chance of a few pop up showers. So a few downpours are likely to develop. But as we get into the rest of the week, we mainly just expect those closer to the coastline. So we're talking De Lavaca County, DeWitt County, Carnes County points eastward to the Gulf Coast. Here in San Antonio, I don't think we'll see any rain by Thursday, Friday into the upcoming weekend. And actually, looks like the upper level high, Big Blue H, will start influencing us more as well. So we're looking at those temperatures to jump up with the sunshine, mid 90s Friday, upper 90s by Sunday and Monday. Mm -mm. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Stay with us.
All across the country, small businesses have been pushed to the brink as they cope with the loss of customers and dollars. Well, one neighborhood bakery of San Antonio's west side knows the struggle all too well, but as Marilyn Mortz shows us, the bakery got a sweet surprise that gives them hope. The doorbell jingle is a sweet sound for this small west side bakery. It means customers are back for their Mexican pastries. I love it with coffee. Inside Guerrero's bakery, the kitchen is bustling. The air smacks of sugar and gratitude. Business was very slow because no school. For more than two months, stay at home orders kept customers away from their usual morning tacos and treats. We haven't been at work, so I hardly ever stop off. So quiet, Karina and Ismael Guerrero wondered if their shop would even make it. We were worried about it, yes, because uh, no customers, uh, no money, uh, no business. Then a customer's Facebook play to rally behind Guerrero's went viral. Skylar Matthews' husband saw it. He said, look, your bakery, and I was like, no, I hope they don't go out of business. They make the best tortillas. <laughs> Old customers and new are now showing up, even lining up. It's important to help small businesses. The boost in business is a testament to the power of community, social media, and a pretty good empanada. Karina says the unexpected support warms their hearts. It's warming their ovens, too. We are grateful, yes. We'll be back. Thank you. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. All right, so tomorrow, a mixture of sun and clouds, a few isolated pop up showers into the afternoon and only about a 20% chance of that. Otherwise, 70 in the morning, 90 later on in the day for the high. Then we see those temperatures climb a bit back into the mid 90s by Friday and we're feeling the heat more into the weekend. Sunday and then even into Monday, we're looking at highs around 98 with a lot of sunshine. And we'll keep an eye on Tropical Storm Cristobal and keep you updated on where that's going to head in the Gulf in the days ahead. All right, that does it for the night. Don't forget, Good Morning San Antonio starts at 430. And before we go, I want to say hi to Jaffney's mother. <laughs> Adam, hi, you want to say hi to Jaffney? Hello. <laughs> Online. Good night, guys.